A recent observational study on acne reported a statistically significant relationship between acne severity and dietary factors, such as chocolate and dairy products, both of which I have videos about. But this surprised me. Sunflower seed consumption? When I think sunflower seeds, I just think good whole food source of nutrition, uh, found to lower cholesterol levels as much as almonds, which is pretty good. Uh, there are, however, right and wrong ways to eat them. If you sit down and eat a pound of unshelled sunflower seeds, just eat them with the shell still on, you can end up corked with a fist-sized mass of shredded sunflower seed shells. How could a doctor diagnose such a thing? By the colonic crunch sign, of course. Sounds like a breakfast cereal served in hell. Uh, <laughs> but rather, it's when you palpate a large, crunchy rectal mass. I've got a picture for you, of course. can end up a sharp, thorny mass, which is why the so-called sunflower seed syndrome has been described as a prickly proctological problem, uh, lamenting that people who consume health foods occasionally fall into the trap of believing if some is good, more is better. It's not the amount, though. It's how they're eating them with the shells still on. That's why the syndrome is uncommon unless the patients are children who don't know any better, or adults who are either impaired or have no experience with eating sunflower seeds. Most cases involve younger children, but here researchers describe a psychologically sound 13-year-old, stressing the importance of the role of the parents to guide their children about the potential problems associated with the ingestion of too many unshelled seeds. You can overdo even shelled seeds, though, because of just the nature of sunflowers. They're good at drying up the naturally occurring heavy metal cadmium out of the ground, so we end up with higher levels than most foods, even if grown in relatively uncontaminated soil. Uh, though people who consume large amounts of sunflower seeds don't seem to suffer any untoward effects, or even end up with detectably higher cadmium levels. And here they defined large amounts as greater than an ounce a week which is like a handful, about 150 seeds. The World Health Organization recommends staying below about 490 micrograms of dietary cadmium a week. I mean, even if you ate a, a handful a day, you'd be well below that, but you may get as much as 36 a day from the rest of your diet, so I think one handful a day is a reasonable, safe upper limit. Yeah, but will it give us acne? You don't know until you put it to the test. Yeah, but who's going to do a randomized controlled trial of sunflower seeds and acne? Nobody. Until now. After all, consuming sunflower seeds is a very enjoyable way of participating in a clinical trial. Fifty young adults were randomized to eat sunflower seeds or not for a week. In the control group, the acne severity index stayed about the same, but in the sunflower seed group, they got worse. Uh, this translates into about three extra pimples in the sunflower group versus about one extra in the control group. They conclude that sunflower seed intake appears to aggravate acne. However, further evidence may be needed before banning sunflower seed intake in patients with acne. Of the half-dozen Viagra-type drugs on the market now, uh, Viagra itself may still have the greatest efficacy, but also the highest rate of overall side effects. It's still a pretty safe drug. Some guy swallowed 65 at a time in hopes he'd go out with a bang, but it didn't work. The most commonly observed acute side effects include headache, flushing, stomach upset, runny nose, and vision abnormalities, but now that it's been around for a decade, some chronic effects may be cropping up. For example, glaucoma, one of the leading causes of blindness caused by degeneration of the optic nerve, up to nearly 10 times the odds of glaucoma among those using Viagra long term. But it's cancer that has the medical community rethinking the safety of these kinds of drugs. Uh, men with advanced prostate cancer often have to get a radical prostatectomy, a surgery that can leave them both incontinent and impotent, uh, which can reduce their quality of life. Uh, therefore, a treatment concept called penile rehabilitation was introduced, where drugs like Viagra are given to counteract the side effects of the surgery. 
But there had been studies like this that found Viagra could decrease natural killer cell activity, and natural killer cells are a first line of immune defense against cancer. Now, this was a study on women for something else, but it did raise concerns about giving Viagra to those battling prostate cancer. In terms of getting prostate cancer in the first place, men treated with Viagra-type drugs tended to have less of a chance of being diagnosed with prostate cancer. Yeah, but that may just be because they're ejaculating more. Higher ejaculation frequency may be associated with a lower risk of prostate cancer. It's, it's interesting the reason they think why. Frequent ejaculations may decrease the concentration within the prostate gland itself of xenobiotic compounds, like hormone-disrupting chemicals and carcinogens. Anything we eat can end up in our prostate. Drink a cup of coffee, and you end up with caffeinated semen 10 hours later. Uh, smoke a cigarette, and the nicotine ends up in the same place. Or eat fish, and end up with one-seventh the healthy sperm count, perhaps because there's like three times the concentration of PCBs. But anyways, you don't know for sure about Viagra until you put it to the test. Nearly 5,000 prostate cancer survivors were followed, and those taking Viagra-type drugs did seem to have a little bump in their risk of the cancer coming back, but subsequent studies failed to find such an association. Uh, what moved me to make this video is the unexpected connection between Viagra and melanoma skin cancer. Um, if treated early, melanoma can be cured by cutting it out, uh, but due to its proclivity to metastasize, in about 20% of patients it progresses to an aggressive invasive disease that can kill in a matter of months. And part of the way it does this is through a gene mutation in the cancer that induces melanoma cell invasion by downregulating an enzyme called the phosphodiesterase 5. Um, does that word look familiar? That's what Viagra does. Viagra works because it's a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor. So Viagra may have the same effect in terms of promoting melanoma growth. You don't know, though until you put it to the test. And Viagra use was associated with an 84% increased risk of subsequent melanoma diagnosis. And you put all the studies together, and the association remains significant. So here we have this class of drugs uh, found in medicine cabinets across the country, and the FDA you know, does its best trying to ensure the safety and efficacy of such drugs, but you can't always anticipate the molecular consequences of inhibiting major cellular pathways. There is, however, an alternative explanation. Uh, maybe users of Viagra are just naked more, thus giving their partners the opportunity to notice some uh, suspicious mole or something, uh, as only about one in three melanomas are discovered by the patients themselves. Lichen planus is a chronic autoimmune disease, typically of our moist membranes, such as the inside of our mouth, but can also affect other body surfaces. And it's not that rare, around 1%, making it one of the commoner conditions seen in oral medicine clinics. Current treatments are not curative, but rather palliative, aimed at relieving pain. We've tried steroids, antibiotics, chemotherapy, surgery, and none appear to be particularly effective. So even for palliative pain relief, we don't have great options. So that's why case reports like this are so exciting. Here's the before, and here's the after one month, then two, three, six, seven months later, after uh, drinking two ounces of aloe vera juice a day and applying Allo topically as well. With these kinds of before and after cases leading to journal articles with titles like Aloe Vera as a Cure for Lichen Planus. But is ingested oral aloe vera a potion or poison? Internal use of aloe may cause acute hepatitis, liver inflammation, as well as electrolyte imbalances, and you should definitely not inject aloe. But Oral use is also not recommended either. 
This is primarily because of case reports of aloe-induced hepatitis. Aloe is ironically presented as a detoxifying product, but can actually end up causing liver damage, uh, like in this guy who was trying to protect his liver and ended up in the hospital. How do we know it was the aloe, though? The assessment of suspected herbal-induced liver injury is challenging, because there's hundreds of things out there that can damage your liver. Here's the kind of checklist you have to go through as a doctor uh, to rule out other causes before you blame it on the plant. Uh, do you have some kind of viral hepatitis or other kind of liver infection? Or it could be various drugs or toxins or diseases. So maybe it was one of these other things. It was just a coincidence that the problem started after drinking aloe. The gold standard, in terms of trying to prove cause and effect, is a positive re-exposure test. Um, that's how you diagnose drug-induced liver injury. Uh, liver inflammation disappears when you remove the drug, and then reappears when you add the drug back, um, which is rarely done for obvious reasons. Well, has there ever been a re-challenge case published for aloe? Yes. Aloe-induced toxic hepatitis that shot up again after stopping and then restarting aloe ingestion. Aloe consumption has also been linked to thyroid dysfunction. A woman with lichen planus started swallowing two teaspoons of aloe vera juice a day. She started feeling unjustifiably tired. Lab work showed her thyroid function was low, but she perked right back up after stopping the aloe, and her thyroid function returned to normal. What if instead of Swallowing, though, she just swished the aloe around her mouth to try to help the lichen planus, and then spit it out. We didn't know until it was put to the test. A randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, 54 patients randomized to a topical aloe vera gel, or placebo gel, for eight weeks. 81% in the aloe group got better, compared to just 4% in the placebo group. Uh, furthermore, two patients treated with aloe had a complete clinical remission. Uh, that's, that's rare. I mean, it's considered a chronic condition. Yet a few weeks applying aloe, these nasty erosive lesions disappeared. How about compared to a steroid ointment, though? Uh, topical aloe vera gel was superior, more effective than the steroids, a significant difference appearing within two weeks. So although corticosteroids are still considered the gold standard, aloe vera shows promising results, especially with no adverse effects when applied topically compared to various adverse side effects of the corticosteroids. That's for oral lichen planus, though. What about the efficacy of aloe vera gel in the treatment of lichen planus of the genitals? Uh, lichen planus of the vulva is quite common, affecting 1% to 2% of the population, and it may be even harder to treat. There are flares and partial remission, but no tendency for complete remission, and indeed that's what they saw in the placebo group. One woman had a good response, but most had little or no response, but applying aloe vera gel instead, and 9 out of 10 responded, and one woman had a complete clinical remission. They conclude that aloe vera gel is a safe and effective treatment. Opinions on marijuana legalization range from regarding it as a landmark human rights advance to one of a disastrous anarchic profiteering sham. Uh, most may agree, though, that the trillion-dollar war on weed has been a failed policy, a vehicle for the hideous expression of our racism, diverting law enforcement resources away from violent crime, and yet having no appreciable effect on marijuana availability. Yes, legalization might free up law enforcement, but opponents argue that legalization may increase marijuana use among the youth, not because they couldn't get it before, but because it'll be cheaper and more socially acceptable. In other words, the argument goes, think about the children. So what happened in states like Washington and Colorado after they legalized marijuana? Among teens in Washington state, perceived harmfulness indeed went down, and marijuana use went up, doubling from 2 to 4 percent. In contrast, no change in Colorado, but presumably that's because they had five years of commercialized medical marijuana before recreational use became legal, and indeed with the original liberalization in Colorado, perceptions of risk among teens dropped more than elsewhere, and rates of dependence went up. 
A frequently cited concern with legalization is that it would allow the rise of big cannabis, uh, similar to big tobacco and big alcohol. After the cannabis industry successfully beat back pesticide regulations in Colorado, public health advocates experienced a feeling of déjà vu, trying to mitigate the adverse public health consequences in the face of an industry that just aims to maximize profit. The biggest concern, though, may not be big cannabis turning into big tobacco, but rather big tobacco turning into big cannabis. Marijuana legalization advocates may not have considered the potential effects of the multinational tobacco companies entering the market. Internal memos show that big tobacco have just been waiting in the wings for the right time to strike. The fact that they created perhaps the leading cause of preventable death in the world shows how much they care about people compared to profits. Uh, so that should raise some red flags. Uh, big Tobacco is expected to profit from legalization whether or not it takes over, though, as frequent cannabis use is a predictor of future cigarette addiction. For teen non-smokers, weekly cannabis use predicted a more than eight-fold increase in the odds of moving from just joints to cigarettes. This may be because tobacco is commonly mixed with cannabis to help it burn more smoothly. Thus, cannabis use may indirectly expose one to tobacco, which may be seven or times more addictive than cannabis. Or it may just be that teens who smoke marijuana are hanging out more with a crowd that tends to smoke more cigarettes, and that's the reason. Though even after controlling for pure use, cannabis does still seem to be a gateway drug to tobacco perhaps as a way to deal with cannabis withdrawal. Either way, one of the most potentially harmful effects of cannabis is that it may lead to nicotine addiction, which wipes out nearly 5 million lives every year, about 24 times more than all illegal drugs combined. Too much cholesterol in the blood has long been considered to act as a primary risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease, and possibly Parkinson's disease. I've shown these striking images of what the brain arteries of Alzheimer's victims look like on autopsy, clogged with fat and cholesterol, compared to non-demented elderly controls. Uh, but wait a second. Cholesterol cannot be directly exported across the blood-brain barrier, so it can't directly get into the brain or out of the brain. Uh, well, what if the brain has too much cholesterol and needs to get rid of some? As a safety valve, there's an enzyme in the brain that oxidizes the cholesterol, and in that form it can exit the brain and eventually the body. Ah, but here's the kicker. Although this fact means that the brain can eliminate excess amounts of these oxidation products, it could be a two-way street. It could allow toxic amounts of oxysterols, oxidized cholesterol, present in the bloodstream to go the other way and accumulate in the brain. This is not just a theoretical concern. This elegant study showed that by measuring oxidized cholesterol levels in the blood coming off of the brain, measuring the jugular vein in the neck, compared to the levels going into the brain through the artery, right, you could measure the difference. And this shows that if you have too much oxidized cholesterol in your bloodstream, it can end up in your brain. Uh, this is a problem because the accumulation of oxysterols can be cytotoxic, mutagenic, atherogenic, possibly carcinogenic, in other words, toxic to cells, toxic to DNA, and contributing to heart disease and maybe cancer. Yes, samples from atherosclerotic plaques on autopsy contain 20 times more cholesterol than normal arteries, but contain 45 times higher levels of oxidized cholesterol. Cholesterol oxidation products may be up to 100 times more pathological, more toxic than unoxidized cholesterol contributing to not only heart disease, but potentially a variety of different major chronic diseases, including Alzheimer's. OK, so how can we cut down on the amount of these oxysterols in our body? Uh, one way is by not eating them. Oxidized cholesterol is found in milk powders, meat and meat products, including fish, cheese, eggs, and egg products. Until recently, our understanding has been limited by the lack of testing methods to accurately analyze the amount found in various foods. Until now. Found throughout animal products, canned tuna was surprisingly high, but ghee 
takes the cake. Ghee, uh, clarified butter, boiled butter, is commonly used in Indian cooking. Uh, the method of preparation appears to multiply oxidized cholesterol levels tenfold. This dietary exposure from oxidized cholesterol may help explain why the subcontinent of India is ravaged by such heart disease, even though a significant proportion of the population stays away from meat and eggs. A number of Indian dairy-based desserts are also made in a similar way. Oxidized cholesterol in the diet is a source of oxidized cholesterol in the human bloodstream, where it can then readily cross the blood-brain barrier into the brain and this could trigger inflammation inside the brain, the buildup of amyloid, all occurring years before the impairment of memory is diagnosed. These early studies showing the buildup of oxidized cholesterol in the blood of those fed meals rich in oxidized cholesterol, where you get the spike in your bloodstream a few hours after you eat, was done with things like powdered egg, which can be found in a lot of processed foods, but you typically don't sit down to a meal of it. You get the same thing, though, from eating normal food sources. Give some folks some salami and Parmesan cheese, which are naturally rich in cholesterol oxidation products, and later that day it's circulating throughout their bodies. And higher levels are not only associated with mild cognitive impairment, but Alzheimer's disease as well. Increased concentrations in the brain may promote cellular damage, cause nerve cell dysfunction, degeneration, and can contribute to neuroinflammation, brain inflammation, and the formation of these amyloid plaques. You can show the boost in inflammatory gene expression right in a petri dish. You can grow human nerve cells in vitro and drip a little cholesterol on, and you get a bump in inflammation, but add the same amount of oxidized cholesterol, and it gets much worse. And if you look at the changes in brain oxysterols at different stages of Alzheimer's disease on autopsy, you can see how the three main cholesterol oxidation products appear to be building up. Levels have been shown to dramatically increase in Alzheimer's disease brains, adding to the evidence that oxidized cholesterol may be a driving force behind the development of Alzheimer's disease. A significant body of evidence indicates that oxidized cholesterol may be one of the main triggers of Alzheimer's disease, but that's not all. Cholesterol oxidation products are associated with the initiation and progression of multiple major chronic diseases, including heart disease, diabetes, and kidney failure. And they're produced when animal products are heated. Um, all forms of cooking can do it, uh, since you can get maximum cholesterol oxidation at only about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but is there some type of cooking that's worse than others? Um, well, if you look at the full meat, uh, which is like uh, baby horse meat, uh, higher levels of oxidation in general were found in microwaved meat and indeed microwaving chicken or beef appears to produce about twice as much cholesterol oxidation than frying. Um, whereas if you look at bacon, uh, raw bacon wasn't found to have any oxidized cholesterol. Right? It has cholesterol, like all animal products, but it's not oxidized until you cook it. Uh, grilling seems to be the safest the first time around, but then when you put it back in the fridge and reheat it later using the same method, they all shoot up. Uh, it's not just heat, though. Although levels in raw meats are usually low, concentrations tend to increase dramatically after exposure to pro-oxidation agents such as light. What are you supposed to do, crawl inside the pig and eat the bacon from the inside? No, you could wrap the meat in red plastic wrap. Uh, clear plastic wrap doesn't seem to work, but the red blocks some of the light waves and can delay cholesterol oxidation. Um, this was for horse meat slices. The problem is worse with sliced meat products, because more of the meat is exposed to air and light. Uh, same problem with ground meat, it's just so much more exposed. Unless you keep meat in some kind of vacuum pack, even in a dark refrigerator, the oxygen exposure alone can shoot up oxidation levels, or in the freezer. Yeah, cooking raw fish can boost levels from 8 to 18, but after a few months, frozen fish, even raw, starts out about 10 times higher and just goes up from there. And in terms of which meat is the worst, microwaved or fried, chicken was twice as bad as beef. Um, the reason, it seems, has to do with the polyunsaturated fat content of the muscle, which goes fish, uh, then poultry, then pork, then beef, then lamb. So white meat is more susceptible to cholesterol oxidation. Um, yes, red meat has more saturated fat, but fish and chicken tend to build up more oxidized cholesterol. 
So chicken and roasted salmon have been shown to generate greater amounts of cholesterol oxidation products than other types of meat. Surprisingly, though, the highest increase of oxidized cholesterol in salmon was found through steaming, mainly just because it's exposed to heat longer. Cholesterol oxidation increased after each cooking procedure, but steaming increased the total amount by more than 1,000%. There are two ways chicken meat may pull ahead, though. Uh, one is if you feed the chickens rancid fat in the first place, and unfortunately all sorts of substandard stuff ends up at the rendering plant to be turned into animal feed. And also irradiation. When chicken meat is radiated to, to, to improve food safety uh, from an infectious disease standpoint, it may diminish food safety from a chronic disease standpoint, but hey, <laughs> better than dying from salmonella. In terms of dairy, in my last video I talked about the potential dangers of ghee, which has made me wonder about UHT milk, which stands for ultra-high temperature processing, uh, to make like those little half-and-half, no-refrigeration-needed coffee creamers. Uh, that does seem to boost oxidized cholesterol levels by about 50%, worse than just regular pasteurization. Uh, though interestingly, if you can find goat milk half-and-half, half, that would be safer. Same problem with eggs. Egg powder in processed foods is good for shelf life, but may not be so good for human life. Uh, so that's like packaged food with eggs in it, like pasta, many baked goods, mayonnaise. So even people who stay away from egg eggs may still be unwittingly exposed through processed foods if they don't read the label. If it's all about oxidation, why not just add synthetic or natural antioxidants to the animal products themselves? They've certainly tried. Like what about adding lemon balm tea to hamburger patties? It didn't work, but that's likely because they couldn't add enough without affecting the taste. What about adding cherries? Their red would blend right in, and it worked. Two different types of tart cherry significantly reduced the cholesterol oxidation. But meat with a cherry on top seems a little out of place. How about just good old garlic and onions? Here's the amount of oxidized cholesterol in a plain pork chop, significantly reduced by adding onion and garlic. Though interestingly, in chicken, cholesterol oxidation was helped by sage, but not garlic. In fact, garlic may even accelerate fat oxidation. So uh, there are several measures that can be taken to reduce cholesterol oxidation in foods, uh, reducing the total cholesterol content in food by not cooking food with cholesterol containing fat like butter or lard. Uh, maybe we can feed animals antioxidants before or, or add them afterwards, uh, use as low a temperature to cook as possible, uh, maybe some kind of opaque vacuum packing or something. Uh, but if you take a step back, only foods that start out with cholesterol can end up with oxidized cholesterol. So the primary method in terms of reducing cholesterol oxidation in foods may be to reduce the total cholesterol content of the food, not just by like avoiding adding extra with butter, but instead centering one's diet around whole plant foods which don't have any cholesterol to get oxidized in the first place. Does an apple a day really keep the doctor away? That's a public health message that's been around since 1866. But is it true? You don't know until you put it to the test. The association between apple consumption and physician visits, published in the AMA's Internal Medicine Journal. Objective? To examine the relationship between eating an apple a day and keeping the doctor away. Promoted by the lay media and powerful special interest groups, including the U.S. Apple Association, so powerful that Big Apple recently spent a whopping $7,000 lobbying politicians. The beneficial effects of apple consumption may include a facilitation of weight loss, protection of the brain, cancer suppression, a reduction in asthma symptoms, improved cardiovascular health. So apple consumers ought to require less medical care, right? Although some may jest, considering the relatively low cost of apples, a prescription for apple consumption could potentially reduce national health care spending if the aphorism holds true. So they compared daily apple eaters 
to non-apple eaters, and asked if they'd been to the doctor in the last year, been hospitalized, seen a shrink, or took a prescription medication in the last month. 8,000 individuals surveyed, and only about 1 out of 10 reported eating an apple over the last 24 hours. And the evidence does not support that an apple a day keeps the doctor away. So maybe it takes more than an apple a day. Maybe we need to center our whole diet around plant foods. However, the, the small fraction of U.S. adults who eat an apple a day do appear to use fewer prescription medications. So maybe the proverb should be updated to clarify that, if anything, apple eating may help keep the pharmacist away. But hey, based on the average medical prescription cost, the difference in annual prescription medication cost per capita between apple eaters and non-apple eaters could be you know, hundreds of dollars. So, so if all U.S. adults were apple eaters, we could save nearly $50 billion. Of course, if you factor in the cost of the apples themselves, we'd only get a net savings of like $19 billion. This all seems a bit uh, tongue-in-cheek apple polishing. You'll note this was published suspiciously close to April Fool's Day, and indeed this was in the tradition of the British Medical Journal's annual Christmas issue that features scientifically rigorous yet light-hearted research, which itself took on the apple issue. To model the effects on stroke and heart attack mortality of all older adults being prescribed either a cholesterol-lowering statin drug or an apple a day. Basically, they took studies like this, where you see this nice dose response, where the more fruit you eat, the lower your stroke risk appears to fall, and similar data for heart disease, compared to the known drug effects, and concluded that prescribing an apple a day is likely to have a similar effect on population stroke and heart attack mortality, as giving everyone statin drugs instead. And hey, apples only have good side effects. Uh, choosing apples rather than statins may avoid more than 1,000 excess cases of muscle damage and uh, more than 12,000 excess diabetes diagnoses because statins increase the risk of diabetes. And this was in the UK. I mean, here in the US, one would expect you know, five times those numbers, though ironically, the cost of apples is likely to be greater than those of statin drugs. I mean, generic Lipitor is like 20 cents a day. So yes, with similar reductions in mortality, the 150-year-old health promotion message of an apple a day is able to match modern medicine. It was likely to have fewer side effects, but uh, apples are a few pennies a day more expensive, not to mention the increased time and difficulty associated with consuming an apple compared to a statin. I mean, just one gulp with the drug compared to all that time-consuming chewing. Higher fruit and vegetable consumption was found to be positively associated with muscle power in adolescents, but that's not who really needs it. Uh, what about the consumption of fruit and vegetables and risk of frailty in the elderly? Higher fruit and vegetable consumption was associated with lower frailty as well, in a dose-response manner, meaning more fruit, less frailty, and more vegetables too. But uh, these were all observational studies, which can't alone prove cause and effect. What happens when you put foods to the test? Well, no positive influence ingesting chia seed oil on human running performance, but there was an effect found for spinach supplementation on exercise-induced oxidation stress. And by spinach supplementation, that meant they just gave some guys some fresh raw spinach leaves, one gram per kilo, so like a, a quarter of a bunch a day for two weeks. And then they had them run a half marathon and they found that chronic daily oral supplementation of spinach, uh, meaning like eating a salad, had alleviating effects on known markers of oxidative stress and muscle damage. And here's what happens when you run a half marathon without spinach, a big spike in oxidative stress, blood malandaldehyde levels that stays up hours or even days later. In the spinach group, the before and after two weeks of spinach doesn't seem to make much of a difference, but put the body under pressure, and then you can really see the difference. Your body is better able to deal with the stress. 
And if you look at the resulting muscle damage, as measured by creatine kinase leakage from your muscles, uh, that, that's an enzyme that should be in your muscles, not leaking out into your blood, uh, you start out at about 100 and go up to 200 after the half marathon right after, and two hours later, but it's the next day where you really feel it, that delayed onset muscle soreness, with CK levels reaching 600 before coming back down. OK, that's without spinach, though. On spinach, you, you get a similar immediate post-race bump, but it's that next day where spinach really shines. Uh, you don't get that same next day spike, and so for a, a competitive athlete, that quicker recovery may get you back training you know, harder sooner. Uh, they attribute this to the anti-inflammatory effects of spinach. Same with black currant juice. After some hardcore weightlifting, muscle damage indicators go up and stay up, whereas the same lifting drinking berries, and it goes up but comes right back down. But these were just measures of a biomarker of muscle soreness. What about actual soreness? If you look at the effects of tart cherry juice on recovery following prolonged intermittent sprints in soccer players, and you see the same kind of reduction in biomarkers of inflammation, but more importantly, less resulting muscle soreness. Here's the soreness reported in the days afterwards in the placebo group, uh, only about half in the cherry group. Then they measured maximum voluntary isometric contractions of the leg muscles, which understandably took a hit in the days after the intense workout, but not in the cherry group. They conclude that participants supplemented with a tart cherry concentrate were able to maintain greater functional performance. Uh, but that was testing like how high you can vertically jump. Uh, they didn't actually see if they played soccer any better. But this study on purple grape juice actually showed an ergogenic effect in recreational runners by promoting increased time to exhaustion, where you ramp people up on a treadmill and see how long they can go before collapsing. After a month of drinking a grape Kool-Aid-type uh, placebo control drink, no real change in performance, but a whopping 15% improvement in the real grape group uh, hung on for another 12 minutes. Uh, they used juice so they could make a matched placebo control drink, but you can buy Concord grapes fresh, or tart cherries fresh, frozen, or water-packed in a can. Uh, I uh, mix them with oatmeal, cocoa, and mint leaves for a chocolate-covered cherry-type sensation. Uh, you may want to try that for a few days before participating in your next big sporting event. There are many examples in nature of intestinal microbes altering host behavior. One such example involves the brain parasite toxoplasma. When it infects a rodent uh, through the gut, it finds its way into the brain and causes the animal to lose its innate fear of the odor of bobcat urine. Why does the parasite care about what mice are afraid of? Because by not avoiding predators, they're more often caught and eaten, so the parasite can then go on to infect other rodents. Uh, if you're a, a mouse brain parasite, how are you going to spread? Uh, mice aren't cannibals, so you have to make sure the mouse you're in is eaten by something else. So the parasite evolved a way to alter the mouse's behavior. Given the potential power of microbes to affect behavior, might the disruption of our gut microbiome, our good gut bacteria, be a potential factor in the causation of autism? Where did they get that idea from? Well, kids with autism do tend to have altered gut flora, uh, different than that of children without autism. For example, significantly less Prevotella in autistic children, which, if you remember, characterized the healthy gut enterotype that you can foster the growth of yourself with a more plant-based diet. But which came first? Instead of the bad gut flora leading to autism, isn't it more likely that the autism led to the bad gut flora? Children with autism eat diets with significantly fewer servings of fruits and vegetables, often characterized by a lack of variety, an inadequate amount of fiber-containing foods, I mean whole plant foods in general, and an increased amount of added sugar. So I mean, couldn't that explain the different gut flora right there? There are some perinatal risk factors for the development of autism, including premature birth, low birth weight, and delivery by cesarean section, uh, particularly the C-section. Uh, what does that have 
to do with the microbiome? Uh, well, there may be a protective value offered by the maternal-vaginal microbiome that the infant misses out on when they instead come out through a surgical incision. But during a C-section, the mother is also sometimes placed under general anesthesia, and it's possible that the anesthetics could affect the baby's brain before he or she is disconnected from the maternal blood supply. To differentiate between the two scenarios, we need a study that compared autism risk between C-sections in which the mom just got an epidural or, or spinal block versus C-sections under general anesthesia. Um, but there's never been such a study until now. This study examined the incidence of autism in infants delivered vaginally, by C-section with just regional anesthesia, and by C-section with general anesthesia. And only those delivered by C-section under general anesthesia had higher risk, not those in C-sections where mom just got like an epidural. So that would suggest the C-section connection is more of an anesthesia drug exposure thing than involving the lack of vaginal flora exposure. This wasn't an interventional trial, though, in which mothers were randomized into various groups, just an observational study, so it's, you know, it's possible the increased autism risk has less to do with the anesthetic itself than the pregnancy complications that may have led to having to put the mother under. Either way, I'm not seeing the microbiome connection. They've tried probiotics for children with autism, and so far they don't seem to have helped much. Uh, some families, in desperation, have tried fecal transplants, where they try to like, beg the neighbor kid to donate. It's like what one fly said to the other, is this stool taken? Not FDA approved, though, so families are forced to go on the brown market. <clears throat> It can all be traced back to this remarkable study published in the Journal of Child Neurology. Several parents of children with regressive onset autism, meaning uh, the kids started out uh, acting normally before the autism struck. Uh, it noted that it all seemed to start after their child had taken antibiotics. They had gotten chronic diarrhea, Autism isn't the only thing that can run in your genes, <clears throat> uh, suggesting the antibiotics had mucked with their gut floor. And then came the loss of language, play, and social skills. Now, this could be a total coincidence, but it led this group of pediatric gastroenterologists to speculate that maybe there was some sort of cause and effect link there. Uh, maybe by wiping out the good bugs, some bad bugs took hold, some neurotoxic bugs, and that led to the autism. If this were true, maybe they could clean the slate once again. Another dose of antibiotics, but this time to try to you know, clear out any bad bugs lurking down there. Might that reduce autism symptoms in these individuals? That would be groundbreaking. They put the kids on a powerful antibiotic called vancomycin, and 80% of the kids got better. But within a few weeks after the treatment, most of them slipped back towards their baseline, suggesting that perhaps the bad bugs got pushed down, but not out. This study was performed nearly 20 years ago, and only had an N of 11, meaning it only looked at 11 kids. The letter N is research speak for the number of subjects in a study. Surely by now there's been lots of larger studies done, but in reality there's only been a single follow-up study published, and it had an N of 1. A case report of a child with autism improving on antibiotics and a father's quest to understand what it all may mean, written by the father himself, describing a dramatic improvement in his child's autism after taking amoxicillin. When he talked to other parents of autistic children, he was surprised to discover that many of them routinely gave their children antibiotics expressly for that purpose though we also heard from other parents that felt that their children's autism got worse after antibiotics, or that antibiotics were blamed for the emergence of the disorder in the first place. Uh, but that all speaks to the potential role of the gut flora, just reinforcing the notion. Other parents were talking about it, but then when he scoured the medical literature to learn more, all he was able to turn up was that 11-child study. How is it possible? that there haven't been follow-up studies. I mean, here it was, right before his eyes, personally witnessing evidence in his own child what this study had shown, the seemingly intractable condition rapidly and dramatically ameliorated in response to an antibiotic. 
at least in some children, but surprisingly there were no attempts to repeat that study. Now, I think most parents would probably just count their blessings that at least it worked on their child and leave it at that, mm, but not this parent. He started his own Autism Research Foundation with the mission of encouraging, sponsoring, and communicating breakthrough autism research. In the preface of how not to die, after bemoaning the fact that I never got taken out to dinner by big broccoli, I wrote that you'll never probably see an ad on TV for whole natural foods because there's just not much of a markup. They're not shelf-stable. You can't brand them, patent them, trademark them. Real food just isn't as profitable as junk. But I may have to eat those words. There was evidently a TV ad for avocados, and during the Super Bowl, no less. Uh, not like avocado-flavored Doritos or something, but an ad for the actual fruit. Thanks to billions of avocados sold every year, giving the avocado board $50 million, not only for ads, but for research. I previously touched on their burger study, in which adding avocado blunted the spike in inflammation one gets within hours of eating meat. Uh, so they added more fat, more calories, but got less inflammation, perhaps because they were adding that fat and calories in the form of a whole plant food, uh, which tend to be packed with antioxidants, which can inhibit the formation of oxidized fats that are formed when meat is cooked and when it hits your stomach acid. Do other high-fat, high-calorie whole plant foods have the same protective effect? What about peanuts, for example? We didn't know until now. Not to be outdone by big guac, the Peanut Institute funded this study with the understanding that you know, most of us spend most of our waking hours in a postprandial state, in other words, an after-meal state, and the fat coursing through our systems from those meals is a well-recognized risk factor for atherosclerosis, the number one killer of men and women, and manifests as impaired endothelial function, meaning crippled artery function within hours of a crappy meal, uh, like a milkshake. 1,200 calories, mostly sugar and heavy cream. OK, but what if you drank that same milkshake with three ounces of peanuts added? Now, to match up the added fat and protein, they had to add some oil and egg whites, and even threw in a fiber supplement to try to match the nutritional profile of the added peanuts as closely as possible. So here you have two milkshakes, pretty much the same calories, same amount of sugar, same amount of protein, same amount of fat, same amount of saturated fat, same fiber. Uh, so on paper, they should cause the same reaction in the body. But peanuts are whole plant foods, and so what you don't see listed here are the thousands of phytonutrients in the peanut milkshake missing from the non-peanut milkshake. Um, would it make any difference? That's what this study aimed to find out. This is showing artery function before either milkshake is ingested, the ability of our arteries to relax and dilate normally. Within hours of consuming the non-peanut milkshake, all that saturated fat and sugar clamps artery function down about 20%. One milkshake. OK, but what if you ate the same amount of sugar and saturated fat, but with a little real food floating in there? No significant drop. So the peanuts help preserve artery function in response to the endothelial insult, a cardioprotective effect presumably due to the active phytonutrients in peanuts. Now, walnuts may work even better. Eat a salami and cheese sandwich with some olive oil, and artery function plummets like a third. But replace that olive oil with the same amount of plant fat in the form of whole walnuts, you don't just blunt the effect of the salami and cheese, but reverse it, ending up actually better than you started out. What about avocados? Research indicates that calorie-dense foods increase inflammation oxidation, thereby contributing to the development of artery disease. However, it's not clear whether the high-calorie load alone, irrespective of the nutritional content of the ingested food, produces that postprandial after-the-meal oxidation and inflammatory activity. And so what this study did was compare the impact of high-calorie junk, high-fat, high-sugar ice cream, a phytonutrient-reduced food, that's an understatement, compared to the effects of the exact same number of calories from a calorie-dense, phytonutrient-rich, whole plant food, avocado. If it's just the concentration of calories, the concentration of fat, right? they should have the same effect. They tested reactions to four different meals— ice cream versus avocado, versus just the fat and protein from the ice cream to separate out the sugar, 
and then just the amount of sugar in the ice cream uh, to separate out the effects of the saturated butter fat. So, two pints of ice cream versus just the cream, versus just the sugar, no fat, versus about four avocados, which ends up having about three times the fat as ice cream and the same amount of saturated fat, and the same whopping load of calories. OK, so what happened? Eat the ice cream, or just the sugar-free components, or just the sugar, and the level of oxidative stress in people's bloodstream goes up. But this is not observed after ingestion of a calorie-equivalent whole plant food. Unlike the ice cream, ingestion of the whole food avocado, even though it's packed with calories and fat, did not produce a rise in oxidative or inflammatory activity, suggesting that the after-meal oxidative stress observed after eating foods such as ice cream may be due to their isolation from nutrients like antioxidants. Sugar is OK in fruit form because it comes naturally prepackaged with phytonutrients. Similarly, the fat in whole plant foods like nuts and avocados comes prepackaged with a rich matrix of phytochemicals, and therefore doesn't demonstrate the same potential for oxidative damage. A trio of Harvard studies that followed more than 100,000 women for more than a decade found that those consuming the most anthocyanins, the brightly colored pigments found in berries like blueberries and strawberries, had an 8% reduction in risk of developing high blood pressure. And the group consuming the most every day were only eating about six strawberries worth, or even just 11 blueberries, a tenth of a cup. But maybe the biggest berry eaters just happened to have other healthy habits, and that's the real reason they did better. I mean, after all, you're probably more likely to sprinkle blueberries on oatmeal than bacon and eggs. But they controlled for whole grain intake, and fiber, and salt, and smoking, and exercise, and a bunch of other things, and the berry benefit still remained. But you don't know for sure until you put it to the test. A randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trial, and the title gives away the thrilling conclusion. Daily blueberry consumption improves blood pressure. How can you do a double-blind trial, though, with a food? How can you convincingly create a fake placebo blueberry? Uh, they used whole blueberries, about a cup's worth, but powdered them versus a look-alike placebo powder, which had the same amount of sugar and calories as the real blueberries, but without actual blueberries. Those in the placebo control group, no real change over the eight-week study. They started out 138 over 79, and ended up 139 over 80. Whereas the real blueberry group fell from 138 over 80 to 131 over 75, a significant drop. Now, 131 is still too high. I mean, you'd like to see at least down to 120 or even 110. So blueberries alone may not cure you. However, the fact that you could get a clinically significant improvement in a killer disease by just adding a single thing to your diet, that's pretty impressive. Is more better? What about twice the dose? More like two cups of fresh blueberries a day. Same kind of significant drop. Uh, but didn't seem to work any better. So one cup may do it, even less may work. It's never been tested. Overall, there's been five interventional studies to date on the effects of blueberry supplementation on blood pressure. Put all the studies together, and the results do not show any clinical efficacy. What? Wait, wait, what? Uh, I, I just showed you two studies where was, there was this gorgeous effect. I mean, have I been cherry-picking studies, or rather berry-picking studies? Well, if you look closely at the studies, the blueberries in the two studies I showed you that detected a significant effect were prepared with water, and they just mixed the blueberry powder with water. However, the blueberries in the non-significant effect studies were prepared with yogurt or, or skim milk-based smoothies. If you remember my blast from the past video from like eight years ago, the absorption of berry nutrients can be blocked by dairy. Uh, mix strawberries with water, and you get a nice peak in strawberry phytonutrients in your bloodstream within hours of consumption. But if it, you instead go for strawberries with cream, mixing the same amount of strawberries with milk instead, significantly less makes it into your system. The inhibitory effects of milk are thought to be due to the interaction between the berry pigments and the milk proteins. Uh, yeah, but does the same thing happen with blueberries? Let's find out. Hard to maintain the suspense when the title just gives it away. But indeed, the antioxidant activity of blueberries is impaired by milk. 
Volunteers ate a cup and a half of blueberries with water or with milk, and the milk blocked the absorption of some phytonutrients, but not others. So did it really matter that much, though? And here's the spikes in the bloodstream after blueberries with water, and here's how much is absorbed with milk. OK, so less, but check out what happened to the total antioxidant capacity of your bloodstream. Eat blueberries alone with water, and the antioxidant power of your bloodstream shoots up within an hour and remains elevated five hours later. OK, so with milk, you'd be thinking, well, there'd maybe be less of a bump, right? You can say that again, not just less, but less than when you started from. You just ate a whole bowl of blueberries and ended up with less antioxidant capacity in your body because you ate them with milk. No wonder mixing blueberries with yogurt or milk may abolish the blood pressure-lowering benefits. Interestingly, full-fat milk may inhibit nutrient absorption the most, similar to what one finds adding milk to tea, twice the reduction in in vitro antioxidant values with whole milk compared to skim milk, which is weird, because we always thought it was the milk protein that was the culprit. This suggests that there may be some nutrient-blocking involvement from the dairy fat as well. Legumes, uh, by which they mean all kinds of beans, chickpeas, peas, and lentils, are an excellent source of many essential nutrients— vitamins, minerals, fibers, antioxidants, and uh, not just an excellent source, perhaps the single cheapest source in terms of nutrition density per penny. Uh, the four that really pull out from the pack are pinto beans, lentils, black beans, and kidney beans. And all that nutritional quality may have beneficial effects on excess body weight, insulin resistance, high cholesterol, inflammation, and oxidative stress, all major cardiovascular risk factors. So uh, do men and women who eat more beans tend to have less heart disease? Yes, suggesting that increasing legume intake may be an important part of a dietary approach to the primary prevention of coronary heart disease in the general population, meaning prevention of heart disease in the first place. But you know, maybe those eating more bean burritos are just eating less beef burritos. And they took that into account, controlling for meat intake, fruits and vegetables, and smoking and exercise, and still the bean eaters appeared to be protected. Note the highest category here was eating legumes four more times a week. Uh, in my daily dozen, I recommend people eat legumes three times a day. In Costa Rica, they were able to find enough people eating beans every day, and so even after controlling for many of the same things, like intake of saturated fat and cholesterol, one bean serving a day was associated with a 38% reduction in the risk of heart attack. Yeah, but do you actually get to live longer too? Yes, apparently so. In 8% lower all-cause mortality, again, uh, after adjusting for other dietary factors. You can't control for everything, though. I mean, you can't really prove cause and effect until you put it to the test. Randomized controlled interventional trials have found that dietary bean intake does significantly reduce bad cholesterol levels. Uh, dating back a half century to 1962, uh, measure cholesterol levels at baseline, and then add beans to their diet, and then remove beans from their diet. And look, beans have a low glycemic index and saturated fat content, and are high in fiber, potassium, plant protein, each of which independently confers blood pressure lowering effects. But whether there's sufficient evidence to emphasize beans alone to lower blood pressure is unclear. Therefore, what we need is a systematic review and meta-analysis of controlled feeding trials, and here it is. And what they found is that beans do indeed lower blood pressure no matter where you start out. OK, so beans may be able to prevent artery disease, but what about reversing it? Can the daily consumption of beans other than soy reverse vascular impairment due to peripheral artery disease? And peripheral artery disease results from a decrease in blood flow to the legs due to a buildup of atherosclerotic plaque higher up. Yeah, soybeans may help, but what about other beans? So they had 26 individuals with peripheral artery disease consume one serving a day of a combination of beans, split peas, lentils, and chickpeas for eight weeks.
basically how you diagnose and follow the disease, is with the ankle brachial index, which is just the ratio of blood pressure at your ankle compared to your arm. Uh, once it dips below 0.9, that means you must have some kind of clogs in blood flow to your lower body. But eat some beans, and you may get a significant increase, uh, enough to push four of 26 participants up into the normal range after just eight weeks eating some beans. Now, there was no control group, but you know, people tend to get worse, not better. The researchers conclude a legume-rich diet can elicit major improvements in arterial function. In a section of the British medical journal called Minerva, where they compile interesting little snippets, they published a picture of a woman who they found had taped a cabbage leaf to her knee. Um, she said that this was the only measure that provided relief from the symptoms of her osteoarthritis. Some doctors responded with bemusement. Others were like, duh, amazed to see the photograph, not because a cabbage leaf was used, but that this was considered newsworthy. Uh, the doctor disclosed she may be a little biased, though, as she admits of being a cabbage leaf user herself. Uh, there's nothing new about this ancient remedy, wrote another reader, used to help reduce all kinds of painful swelling. Freshly washed cabbage leaves are known in European folk medicine as the poor man's poultice, so uh, there's nothing freakish or stupid about putting cabbage leaves on your knees. Uh, okay, I didn't realize it was such a touchy topic. Of course, we'll never really know if it actually works. I mean, there's never been a randomized controlled trial of topical cabbage leaves for osteoarthritis, and you know, there never will be. Until now. The efficacy of cabbage leaf wraps in the treatment of symptomatic osteoarthritis of the knee, a randomized controlled trial. Wait, how did this study even get funded? A family foundation just stepped forward and paid for it. I love that. In fact, the, the former president and first lady of Germany's foundation. After all, osteoarthritis of the knee is one of the most common chronic diseases among older adults, so let's test the effects of cabbage leaf wraps. Why not? Patients with confirmed osteoarthritis of the knees were randomly assigned to four weeks of treatment with a cabbage leaf on their knees every day, or a topical pain gel containing an anti-inflammatory drug, or neither. Um, even better would have been a fourth group applying like iceberg lettuce leaves, but uh, I'll take what I can get. Here's a graph of pain intensity over the 28-day experiment. Here's how the drug worked. Not much better than doing nothing. But the cabbage worked better. Overall, the study found that a four-week application of cabbage leaves was more effective than usual care with respect to pain, functional disability, and quality of life. It was, however, not in the final analysis superior to a four-week application of a topical medication. But hey, cabbage leaves are safe, can be used in the longer term, and so why not give them a try? It also wouldn't hurt if you ate some as well, as cabbage may have internal anti-inflammatory potential as well. Uh, the anti-inflammatory effects may explain the health benefits of the cabbage family vegetables. Not just potent anti-inflammatory effects in petri dishes, but in people. Ten days of broccoli consumption in smokers cut CRP levels 40%. OK, but what about for arthritis? In vitro, sulforaphane, the magic cabbage chemical, protects cartilage from destruction, suggesting that a high cabbage or broccoli family vegetable diet may be a useful measure, either to prevent or to slow the progression of osteoarthritis. But even if sulforaphane can protect cartilage cells in a petri dish, how do we even know that this compound makes it into the joint when we eat it? I mean, no one's ever done a study where you'd like have people eat broccoli and then stick a needle in their knee joint to check. Uh, no one, that is, until now. And sulforaphane was indeed detected in the synovial fluid of 40 patients with osteoarthritis following broccoli consumption, followed by significant epigenetic changes of gene expression within the joint. Uh, the next step is to see if it can actually improve the disease. 
Despite warnings from the American Academy of Dermatology and being listed as a fake cancer cure by the FDA, so-called black salve is still promoted on the Internet through anecdotal and unsubstantiated claims as a natural alternative remedy for skin cancer. Uh, it typically contains a caustic chemical called uh, zinc chloride and blood root, a native herb that can be like poison ivy on steroids. It's ironic that people seek it out as a quote-unquote natural therapy, when it may mostly just be a stew of caustic chemicals that together form a corrosive paste that indiscriminately damages healthy and diseased tissue alike. But that's not what the claims on the Internet says. Uh, black salve is touted as a selective treatment, only killing off cancer cells and abnormal tissue, when in fact, in some cases, the exact opposite is true. Some cancer cells resist the damaging effects better than normal cells. Normal skin cells can be more vulnerable to the toxic effects than cancer cells. When tissue samples are taken from black salve treatment lesions, the damage to normal tissue is readily apparent. It can burn right through and like leave you with an extra nostril, or even worse, one less nostril. This isn't just buyer beware, but viewer beware. Some of these are graphic images, like this, where, where he like burned half his nose off. Uh, now, on the nose, you can just be left with cosmetic defects, but put it on the face, and it can eat all the way through down to an artery. And the irony of all this is that when asked why users decided to order it off the Internet, they said it was because they were fearful of pain and scarring from conventional therapy. Uh, but then you end up with these disfiguring deformities, uh, whereas after conventional treatment, where skin cancers are just surgically removed, about 9 out of 10 reported satisfactory cosmetic results. About three-quarters of black salve users surveyed were unaware of the potential adverse side effects of black salve treatment. Yeah, but does it work? Because of its escarotic or tissue-sloughing character, corrosive black salve products may destroy both cancerous and healthy skin to a degree that eradicates a local cancer. So who cares if it you know, leaves an aesthetically unpleasing result? Well, the problem is that without a biopsy, there could be no guarantee that the cancer has been completely eliminated. If residual cancer cells persist, the risk of recurrence or metastasis remains. And that's uh, probably the biggest concern. Uh, see, people think that if a mole or whatever goes away, that means the cancer's gone. But that may not be the case. Uh, malignancy may persist under a black salve scar tissue and you know, extend under the skin. Here's a good example to illustrate. A case study of a woman diagnosed with superficial spreading melanoma who decided to go against her dermatologist's advice and instead treat the lesion with black salve. By the time she was seen again a few years later, it had spread to her lymph nodes, lungs, and liver. Had she been treated early and had it removed, her prognosis would have been good, nearly a 90% 10-year disease-free survival. But once she came back after it had spread, her survival prognosis may have dropped to about 2.5%, from, from 90 to 2.5%. And so that's the second irony. I mean, conventional allopathic medicine has had an extraordinarily proven track record of successful treatment for skin cancer. I mean, it's one of the few cancers we're really good at curing because we can catch it so early, because you can see it emerge and so easily cut it out. So like for basal cell carcinoma, the most common type of skin cancer, conventional surgery has up to a 99% cure rate. Squamous cell carcinoma, about 95%, and the most common type of melanoma, up to 90%. With escherotic therapies like black salve, there is no scientifically documented proof of efficacy, period, since there's never been any clinical trials. And so all we're left with are glorified anecdotes, ranging from patient satisfaction to unacceptable scarring to invasive recurrent tumors to ulcer complications to death. So why do people use it? Well, why do cancer patients seek out alternative therapies in general? I mean, yes, some of it is misinformation. They're just duped by snake oil salesmen. But a lot of it may be negative experiences with the current medical system. Uh, many of those who refused conventional therapies describe their oncologists as intimidating, cold, uncaring, unnecessarily harsh, uh, thinking they were God, who sometimes didn't 
to even know their names. Some reported their physicians became adversarial when questioned about treatment recommendations. Almost all the conventional therapy refusers described the way they were treated as impersonal, and few believed their doctors were working in their best interest. So they left conventional medicine in search of more caring practitioners. You know, looking back, many said that uh, had they had a better first experience with their physicians, they might have, it might have made a difference in their treatment path they ultimately chose. Uh, they said uh, that they would have been more likely to accept conventional treatment earlier had they felt that they had caring physicians who treated them with respect. In the United States, millions of people have been diagnosed with an opioid use disorder, and more than 80 Americans that die each day from opioid overdose. Where is this coming from? Well, most new heroin users start out on prescription drugs, prescription opioid painkillers. This is important because more than 200 million opioid painkiller prescriptions are still written every year. Did you catch that number? 200 million prescriptions every year in the United States, a number closely approximating the entire adult population. That's incredible. When you see something like the opioid addiction crisis blossoming in so many states around this country, said White House spokesperson Sean Spicer, the last thing we should be doing is encouraging people to smoke cannabis. But if opioid addiction starts with people taking prescription pain pills, maybe cannabis would reduce the problem by offering a substitute painkiller. Or you could see it going the other way, where cannabis acts like a gateway drug or stepping stone to harder drugs and could make the opioid epidemic worse. Uh, well, first, does cannabis work? Is it a truly effective drug for pain that has been arbitrarily stigmatized and criminalized by the federal government? or is it without any medical benefit at all, and its advocates are just hiding behind a smokescreen, pun intended, of misplaced or deliberately misleading compassion for the ill. The official position of the American Medical Association is that marijuana has no scientifically proven currently accepted medical use for preventing or treating any disease. But what does the science say? Well, despite the widespread use of opioids, the majority of advanced cancer patients may die with unmet pain relief needs. And so adding cannabis may help, as double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trials have found that cannabis compounds do produce pain relief, uh, equivalent to moderate doses of codeine, an opioid used to treat mild to moderate pain. But wait, if you're dying from cancer, uh, don't you want the good stuff? Why not just crank up the morphine? Uh, look, if you want, you could put someone in a coma, erase all their pain. But the problem with these high doses of opiates is that you know, here you are at the end of life, surrounded by loved ones, and you're so gorked out you can't even say goodbye. So that's where cannabis may help, allowing someone to drop the opiate dose down a bit without compromising pain control. That's what many report, anyway. If you look at New England, which is like ground zero for the opioid epidemic, uh, there were enough opioids dispensed from main pharmacies in one year to supply every person in the state with a 16-day supply. What are they doing up there? But among New Englanders surveyed who were on opioids, most claim that they reduced their opioid use since they started medical cannabis. Uh, some also reduce their use of antidepressants, alcohol, anti-anxiety, medications, migraine meds, sleeping pills. 40% said they were able to reduce their opioid use a lot. It may even reduce the use of crack. It, it may seem strange to give drugs to drug addicts, but if people even partially switch from more to less harmful drugs, overall harm may be reduced. So what happened after medical marijuana laws were passed? Did opioid overdoses go up, stay the same, or go down? They went down. Medical cannabis laws are associated with significantly lower opioid overdose mortality rates, about a 25% lower rate of overdose deaths, the striking implication of which is that medical marijuana laws may represent a promising approach for stemming the opioid overdose epidemic. If true, this finding upsets not only the apple cart of conventional wisdom regarding the public health implications of marijuana legalization, 
but also of its medicinal usefulness. Here the AMA is saying it doesn't do anything helpful medically, but if people are getting enough benefit to cut down on their prescriptions, then obviously something's going on. What about other prescription drugs? Once medical marijuana laws were passed, fewer people were filling prescriptions for not just painkillers, but anti-anxiety drugs, antidepressants, anti-nausea drugs, anti-psychotics, anti-seizure drugs, and sleeping pills. If all states did that, then that could save around a half billion dollars a year. But the half billion taxpayers save is the half billion drug companies lose. So no wonder the drug companies are freaking out. Why do you think pharmaceutical corporations were major sponsors of the marijuana prohibition lobby, trying to stop legalization? The makers of OxyContin, Vicodin, other major funders of the opposition included the beer industry and the private prison industry. We've previously explored the issue of lead contamination in calcium supplements like bone meal, but it wasn't just bone meal, and substantial quantities of lead were found in other more common over-the-counter supplements. Still, uh, testing revealed continued public health concern over bone meal, but thankfully it's not as popular these days. So many of us are not likely to get directly exposed to the lead in bone meal anymore, but may get indirectly exposed to the animals we eat. In the U.S., 5 billion pounds of meat and bone meal are produced as slaughterhouse byproducts every year. Uh, what do we do with these millions of tons every year? We feed it back to farm animals, uh, particularly chickens. Uh, now, most of the lead in the bone meal passes right through the animals into their waste, but then we take that waste, cow, pig, and chicken feces, and feed it back to the animals again. You guessed it. So, you can see how the levels of contaminants might build up in their bodies. Uh, I've talked previously about what that might mean for making something like chicken soup, but the original concern about these kind of feeding practices, feeding cows to cows and pigs and chickens, was the spread of prion diseases like mad cow disease. Uh, but it's not just prions that this kind of recycling can magnify, but other toxic substances, including lead. So more plant-based diet may be able to lower lead exposure, and even more plant-based diet could theoretically lower exposure even more. But you've got to put it to the test. Uh, but should we expect to find a benefit? I mean, yes, lead is one of the toxins found in meat, but half of our dietary exposure probably comes from plant foods. Uh, dietary modeling studies in Europe suggest that vegetarians would be exposed to about the same amount of lead compared to the general population, with the exception of those who eat a lot of wild game, which can end up with a thousand times more lead than most other foods. In fact, a vegetarian diet may even be higher in lead, but it's not what you eat, it's what you absorb. As we learned from the cadmium story, the uptake of toxic heavy metals from animal food sources into the human intestinal lining cells may be higher than that from vegetable sources. Uh, that's how you have a vegetarian with some of the lowest concentrations of lead and cadmium in their blood, despite higher concentrations in their diet. But you don't know until you put it to the test. There seemed to be a tendency towards higher fecal elimination of lead following a change to a vegetarian diet, with nine subjects on average tripling their elimination of lead, three unaffected, and four dropping by about half. But the study only lasted a few months. The difference wasn't statistically significant. So let's try a year. A shift towards a diet characterized by large amounts of raw vegetables, fruits, and unrefined foods, whole grains, with the exclusion of meat, poultry, fish, and eggs, though it did include fermented dairy like a type of soured milk, as well as cutting back on processed food and junk. They took clippings of hair before and after the shift and got significant reductions in heavy metals, including cutting their lead level nearly in half. Uh, check this out. This is how much mercury, cadmium, and lead they had oozing from their body into their hair when they started and within three months their toxic heavy metals went down and stayed down. How do we know it wasn't just a coincidence? Because they went back up a few years later after the study was over, after they went back to more of a regular diet, and their mercury, cadmium, and lead levels shot back up to where they were before. 
Same thing with a different group after two years. The drop in mercury is easy to explain, presumably due to the drastic drop in fish consumption, and the drop in alcoholic beverages may have contributed to the drop in lead, but it could also have been a cadmium-like effect, where the decrease in hair lead content could be due to the dietary shift resulting in less absorption of lead into the body in the first place. Given the huge number of cell phone users these days, even small, simple, adverse health effects could have major implications. The major concern is that they're usually held close to the head, resulting in significant exposure to the brain. But you know, what other tissues are on the side of the head where the phone is usually placed? Like, how about your inner ear? I mean, that's the organ most frequently and directly exposed to cell phone radiation. So what about possible adverse effects on hearing? In fact, the ear canal may provide a natural route by which you know, emissions can go deeper into our skull. OK, well, a first natural question to ask might be, do long-term cell phone users have worse hearing? Apparently so. Cell phone users were found to have detectable hearing loss, though not enough to be noticeable, uh, suggesting long-term cell phone use might damage the inner ear. The damage done was bilateral, detectable in both ears, which may be more consistent with a radiation effect than just a constant loud noise in one ear effect. Now, this was comparing users to complete non-users. If you compare heavy to light users, there appears to be a dose response, meaning the longer the duration of daily cell phone use, up to four or five hours a day, the more the hearing loss, the, the higher the sound threshold before they could hear this hearing test tone, clearly revealing, the researchers concluded, the hazardous effects of mobile phone use on auditory function. Based on the study, they recommend that cell phones be used judiciously, as there does not seem to be any difference between non-users and those that just used it like 10 or 20 minutes a day. However, two hours a day did appear to be associated with a certain amount of hearing loss, uh, blamed on the exposure to the electromagnetic fields generated by the phones. I mean, uh, but to make a claim like that, you can't just use observational studies like these. You need to put it to the test. To see if cell phone signals could affect the auditory nerve at all, period, they directly exposed the nerve to a cell phone hovering right over it in the middle of brain surgery for five minutes, and saw a dramatic deterioration of the nerve impulses. So much so, they decided to stop the experiment early to, you know, to avoid possible permanent damage. So obviously, this is a very unnatural situation, clearly far from reproducing EMF exposure, where you have things like skin, bone, blood, and brain in the way. But I mean, it does show that cell phone emissions are powerful enough to at least potentially affect nerve function. OK, but how about an interventional study on the effects of cell phones on hearing with your skull actually on? The first study ever published, and 10 minutes of cell phone exposure had no effect. OK, so far so good. What about longer than 10 minutes? No effect at 15, 20, or 30 minutes either. That's a relief. What about 60? 60 minutes did appear to have an immediate impact on hearing threshold levels at specific frequencies. Again, not to the extent someone would notice, but enough to be picked up on these hearing tests. What if you wear a Bluetooth headset? I mean, does Bluetooth radiation affect hearing? No effect on your pet rat. But what about the other members of your family? 30 volunteers were exposed to a Bluetooth headset device on standby for six hours, then full power for 10 minutes, and no changes in hearing detected. Uh, maybe Bluetooth emissions just don't have the power to affect nerves? I mean, it's too bad that brain surgery group didn't try waving around some Bluetooth headsets, too. Oh, but they did. After showing that cell phone fields could deteriorate nerve impulses, they decided to repeat the experiment to see if the same thing happened with Bluetooth fields. Uh, Bluetooth operate at higher frequencies, which at the same power might be more hazardous, but uh, Bluetooth operates at nearly a thousand times lower strength. No surprise, then, that the Bluetooth device had no effect on the auditory nerve, even when it was completely exposed. Uh, taken together, the researchers conclude these findings indicate that using a Bluetooth headset may be safer in terms of effects on the nervous system, and therefore represents a, a viable solution for safer cell phone operation. 
In my latest literature review on the health-promoting properties and therapeutic applications of chia seeds, I ran into a lot of studies like this. Strategies for incorporation of chia into frankfurters as a health-promoting ingredient. After all, in recent years we've seen an increasing pursuit of healthier lifestyles, healthier dietary habits. In response to this, there's been a great deal of interest in compounds originally present in plants to provide health benefits in real foods like hot dogs. And indeed, reformulated frankfurters with chia contain significantly greater amounts of plant protein, fiber, minerals. In fact, given this new nutritional profile, such hot dogs could qualify for labeling with a variety of nutrition and health claims. And what do you know? The chia-enriched restructured pork affects aged rats fed bad diets, so let's slap on a health label. Chia has been eaten for thousands of years, so that would suggest it's at least safe to eat, but does it have any special benefit? It's certainly nutritious, got lots of fiber, antioxidants, uh, black chia seeds, perhaps more than white, plant protein, of course, a source of B vitamins, source of minerals, so you know, nutritious, sure, but just like nearly any whole plant food. But again, any special benefits? Uh, there's all sorts of claims out there by people trying to sell you chia seeds, but to definitively establish their actual beneficial effects, we need a little something called scientific evidence, instead of just cultural tradition, personal beliefs, or inaccurate advertising, which is a redundant term if I've ever heard one. For example, and there are about 50,000 videos on YouTube on chia seeds and belly fat. But what does the science say? Dietary chia seeds does reduce belly fat in rats, does apparently reduce the weight of chickens. Evidently, people don't like smelling or tasting fishy chicken, so by feeding chickens chia seeds, you can boost their omega-3 levels without it turning into funky chicken. But what happens if you just cut out the middle hen and eat chia yourself. What happens if you add a teaspoon or two of chia seeds to yogurt as a snack? After the yogurt with the chia, participants reported significantly less hunger, and that then later translated to eating fewer calories two hours later at lunch. Now, my initial thought was uh, give people more food, add chia to whatever they're eating, and they're less hungry. Duh! But no, they gave people less yogurt to compensate, so each snack had the same number of calories. So we can say at least that chia seeds are more satiating than yogurt, uh, but at lunch two hours later, they didn't just eat a little less food, but like 25% fewer calories after the chia. A teaspoon of chia seeds only has like 50 calories, uh, yet they ended up eating nearly 300 calories less at lunch, uh, way more than compensating. So if you did that every day, ate some chia seeds as a snack, and one teaspoon seemed to work as well as two, you'd expect to lose weight over time. You don't know, though, until you put it to the test. Subjects were randomized to a whole tablespoon of chia seed twice a day for months before the first and last meal for 12 weeks, and they found chia seed does not promote weight loss after all. Huh. Well, we know from the flaxseed literature, if you give people muffins made out of whole flax seeds, they don't seem to really absorb all the benefit compared to ground flaxseed muffins, and the same appeared to be true with chia seeds. Eat whole chia seeds for 10 weeks, and no increase in short-chain omega-3 levels or long-chain omega-3s, but eat the same amount of chia seeds ground up and levels shoot up. So maybe the problem with this study is that they gave people whole chia seeds. There's never been a study on ground chia and weight loss until now. A randomized controlled trial, about two tablespoons of ground chia a day versus a fiber match control made mostly of oat bran. That's how you know it wasn't funded by a chia seed company, because they put it head-to-head -head against a real control, not just a sugar pill or something, to control for the fiber content. So then if there was weight loss, I mean, we know it wasn't just the fiber, but something particular to the chia. And those eating the ground chia lost significantly more weight, significantly more waste in terms of waist circumference, a measure of belly fat, and as a bonus, C-reactive protein levels suggesting a, an anti-inflammatory effect as well. So maybe some of those 50,000 YouTube videos weren't completely off.
There is one form of chia powder I'd stay away from, though. I've talked about using chia gel to replace eggs or oil in baking. You mix a teaspoon of seeds with a quarter cup of water and let it sit for half an hour. Certainly a way to lower cholesterol, but here you are cutting down on your salmonella risk, and there was an international outbreak of salmonella linked to sprouted chia seed powder. Sprouting can create an ideal environment for bacterial growth. 94 people infected across 16 states, granted not as bad as salmonella-tainted eggs, which may sicken 79,000 Americans every year, but still, I would recommend staying away from sprouted chia seed powder. If you go online, you can see claims that coconut water may be beneficial for depression. And they even cite studies. There it is, in black and white. Coconut water ameliorates depression. Did they just make that up? No. Uh, click on it, and there it is in PubMed, just like they said. And for a limited time offer of just $39.95, the publisher will let you read it. But why waste your time? It says it right there in the title, Coconut Water Ameliorates Depression. Might as well spend that uh, 40 bucks buying some coconut water to boost your mood. And anyway, reading all the studies so you don't have to, that's my job. If you look at the study, it starts out that saying, you know, plants are frequently tested these days for their antidepressant potential. OK, sounds good. Therefore, coconut water, a commonly used plant-based beverage, was selected to explore its antidepressant potential. With you so far? So rodents were selected for this study, and a forced swim test was conducted. What? The forced swim test is one of the most widely used tests to explore antidepressant activity. You, you fill up a transparent cylinder with water over the mouse's head so it's forced to swim, and then you drop a mouse in and see how long the thing struggles to keep from drowning before you see it simply give up and just kind of float to the top. And lo and behold, you feed them some coconut water first, and they hold out a bit longer before giving up, demonstrating an antidepressant effect. Therefore, we should use coconut water to treat depressive disorders in people? What? I mean, it depresses me to even read such wasted research opportunities. Where did they even get this idea? It was invented by a group of French scientists in the 70s to model behavioral despair. It reminds me of the Harlow experiments with vertical chamber confinement that he called the pit of despair, which was basically just a metal contraption with sloped sides, lock a baby monkey in it for 45 days, and you can produce profound behavioral changes. They end up just kind of hugging themselves in a fetal position. And then afterwards, after 10 weeks alone in the chamber, they exhibit behaviors like contact clinging, where they just come together and hug each other for long periods of time. Uh, it's not yet clear why confinement in the vertical chamber is apparently so effective at producing abnormal behavior, but not to worry that it's got a lot more studies to do. Oh spare you the research on puppies. I can see why you'd, you'd want some model to test out new antidepressant drugs, but if you want to figure out if pomegranates have antidepressant effects, why not just feed people some pomegranates rather than chucking some mice off the deep end? There are literally thousands of published studies on food or food products using this forced swim test, allowing the egg industry to be like, see, Eggs may be an excellent food for preventing and alleviating the conditions of major depression. Why? Uh, all because rats struggled longer? Whereas in people, removing eggs from the diet improves mood, though they also remove meat, so it's not clear which did what, or maybe they were just eating more healthy plant foods like soy, which the soy industry is happy to tell you decreases depressive-related behavior in postmenopausal rats who were swimming for their lives. In people, though, uh, the best soy products may be able to do is just work as well as drugs like Prozac and Zoloft, and we all know how little that's actually saying. I mean, the forced swim test is just a reaction to the acute stressful stimulus of being placed in a container without an escape route, whereas you know, human depression uh, reflects a chronic subjective emotional state, an internal emotional state, and you know, to date we haven't been able to ask animals how they're feeling. 
you can't even just look at human behavior and tell if someone has a depression diagnosis. So it's impossible to conclude that the swim test is some test for human depression. The ease at which thousands of scientists do that, however, is disquieting in that it makes assumptions that discourages critical thought. In fact, the whole thing has been compared to like some Monty Python skit where you see if the witch floats or not, but today it's in use to label a rodent as being depressed. What are some of the ways we can decrease our exposure to the carcinogenic substances in meat that are formed during cooking? They have a whole list of hazard factors. Uh, the first factor is meat type, with processed meat, red or white, being the worst. Then temperature, you know, cooking at under 260 degrees Fahrenheit, so like boiling or microwaving, safer. Whereas broiling, uh, roasting or pan frying, is the worst. Uh, turning it over every minute lowers risk. And rather than a dark and flavorful crust, they recommend pale and soft. Um, cooked rare lowers risk as long as you meet food safety guidelines. Spices or a vinegar-containing marinade lowers carcinogen formation. Uh, avoid gravy. Stick to one serving, which is like a deck of cards or the size of a bar of soap. And eat vegetables and fruit with your meal. Even just being around a barbecue may be a bad idea, even if you don't eat anything off of it. Here they estimate the extra lifetime cancer risk associated with standing about 6 feet away from a charcoal grill every day, and about 30 feet away with both 25% skin exposure and 100% skin exposure. They're not talking about grilling in the nude. Uh, this is out of a recognition that light clothing probably provides little protection from these gaseous carcinogens. You know, skin contact is often neglected, these kinds of risk assessments of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, but we know it's a problem from studies on firefighters that show that even in full protective gear, breathing through a respirator, they still end up with these compounds in their bodies, likely through their neck uh, under their helmets. These results indicated that outdoor exposure to barbecue fumes, particularly through the skin, may have become a significant but largely neglected source of health hazards, but their estimates were from barbecuing once a day, every day, year-round. Though they're thinking that toxic fumes might actually like, stick to people's clothing, which could then you know, bring it inside with them you know, to continue exposure. Um, these are all some of the chemicals that led to the official scientific body that determines what is and is not carcinogenic to declare that processed meat does cause cancer, and red meat probably causes cancer. They considered both the nitrites in processed meat as well as these cooked meat carcinogens. However, due to the practically unavoidable presence of other carcinogenic compounds which are already present in raw or unprocessed meats, these chemicals are not the only potentially carcinogenic substances in meat and meat products. These other substances are well-known environmental pollutants, uh, such as some heavy metals, dioxins, PCBs, so-called persistent organic pollutants to which were primarily exposed via dietary intake of dairy products, meat, and fish. Although dioxins are created when paper pulp is bleached, but I have a feeling this is an autocorrect error. How bad a problem is this in the United States? Well, the USDA examined whether levels of dioxin-like compounds in meat and poultry indicate possible concern of U.S. public health, and they concluded that a typical U.S. adult exposure is below the EPA-established reference dose, meaning the maximum acceptable limit of a toxic substance. Only children consuming average daily servings of meat or poultry, regularly consuming the highest levels, may exceed the limit. Putting all the carcinogens together, some toxicologists suggest limiting the consumption of beef, pork, and chicken, such that children consume at most five servings combined of all these meats each, so on average like one serving every six days or so max. Yeah, but what about organic meat? This study on the carcinogenic risks associated with the intake of various meats 
estimated the risk was so great that we may not want to feed beef, pork, or chicken to kids more than like five times a month. This was in Europe, where lamb contamination is a particular problem. In the United States, if there was any standout, it would be chicken and PBDEs, flame-retardant chemicals, not only compared to other meats, but other countries. U.S. chickens are like 10 to 20 times more contaminated than samples taken from other countries that have been tested. Uh, though diet is not the only source of exposure, as those eating vegetarian have only about 25% lower levels in their bloodstream than those eating meat, though a large proportion of that may be from chicken. For other chemicals, diet may play a larger role. Studies of the pollutants in the breast milk of vegetarians dating back over 30 years have found the average vegetarian levels of some pollutants were only 1 to 2 percent as high as the national average. In fact, for the six out of seven pollutants they looked at, there wasn't even overlap in the range of scores. The highest vegetarian value was, was lower than the lowest value obtained in the general population. This is presumed to be because these pollutants concentrate up the food chain. So uh, biting uh, lots from all the way down the food chain, plants, those eating vegetarian, may have an edge. For example, dioxins. And meat, fish, and dairy believe to contribute almost all of the dioxin body exposure. Indeed, if you look at those eating strictly plant-based diets, they may only have about a third of the level of dioxins and PCBs, or even less than a fifth circulating throughout their bodies. This study really struck me. India has been facing a major problem of treating its millions of pounds of electronic waste every year, and these uh, poor workers of these electronic waste recycling plants can be exposed to high levels of toxic chemicals, ending up with this kind of concentration of PCBs in their bloodstream twice as high as those living about 250 miles away along the coast. But these were non-vegetarian workers at the waste plant the PCB levels of the vegetarians working at the same plant was even lower. The problem with these cross-sectional studies is that we can't single out the diet. Maybe vegetarians have other lifestyle behaviors that protect them. You don't know until you put it to the test. Change people's diets and see what happens. That's hard to do with persistent pollutants like PCBs, which may take literally decades to detoxify from the body. But we can get rid of heavy metals like mercury in a matter of months. And indeed, within three months of the exclusion of meat, poultry, fish, and eggs from their diets, there was a significant drop in the levels of toxic heavy metals in their bodies, including mercury, cadmium, and lead, uh, up to about a 30% drop within three months. Uh, what if we just stick to organic meat? Certified organic meat comes from livestock that are fed with organically produce feed that is free from pesticides and animal byproducts by law, and therefore one would assume that there should be a lower accumulation of chemical residues. However, on a practical level, there are simply no studies on the chemical residue content in organic meat until now. Researchers acquired 76 samples of different kinds of meat, both organic and conventional, and quantify their levels of contamination with 33 different carcinogenic persistent organic pollutants. After all, the ingestion of food contributes more than 90% of the total current exposure to these compounds, especially food from animal origin. On the other hand, an increasing number of consumers are choosing organic. In fact, organic food production increased like 50% during the last decade, so are consumers of organic meat protected or not? Well. No sample was completely free of carcinogenic contaminants, which is to be expected, given how polluted our world is these days. But what was surprising was that the difference between organically and conventionally produced meats were minimal. Uh, furthermore, the current pattern of meat consumption exceeded the maximum limits either way. Uh, strikingly, the consumption of organically produced meat not only doesn't appear to diminish this carcinogenic risk, but was sometimes found to be even higher. Bottom line, sadly, is that the consumption of organic meat does not diminish the carcinogenic potential associated with the intake of these pollutants. A number of artificial sweeteners have been FDA-approved in North America, including aspartame and sucralose, sold as Splenda, 
but there are also natural high-intensity sweeteners found in plants. Uh, the global market for non-nutritive sweeteners in general, these non-caloric sweeteners, is in the billions, including all the artificial ones, and two natural ones extracted from plants, stevia and monk fruit. I've done a video about stevia. What about monk fruit? Roots of luohongguo, uh, monk fruit in Chinese, have evidently been used for hundreds of years as a natural sweetener in folk medicine. The non-caloric sweet taste comes from magracides, a group of uh, cucurbitane-type triterpene glycosides, uh, make up about 1% of the fruit, and are like hundreds of times sweeter than sugar. The mixed magracides have been estimated to be about 300 times as sweet as table sugar, such that an 80% extract was nearly 250 times sweeter than sugar. If you read reviews in Chinese natural medicine journals, you'll see pronouncements like this. Monk fruit has been shown to have anti-coughing effects, anti-asthma, anti-oxidation, liver protection, blood sugar lowering, immunoregulation, and anti-cancer. But what they don't tell you up front is that they're talking about reducing ammonia-induced mouse coughs. A natural food sweetener with anti-pancreatic cancer properties? Monk fruit may be used for daily consumption as an additive in foods and drinks to prevent or treat pancreatic cancer. Uh, yeah, maybe in your pet mouse. And the anti-proliferative activity of monk fruit in colorectal cancer and throat cancer was on colorectal and throat cancer cells in a petri dish. Now, they did show mogricides killing off colorectal cancer cells and throat cancer cells, and Look, our digestive tract could be directly exposed to these compounds if we ate them, but what's missing? Right, they didn't test it against normal cells. I mean, you could pee in a petri dish and kill off cancer cells. I mean, the whole point is to find something that kills off cancer but leaves normal cells alone, something that they weren't able to show here. Are there any human studies on monk fruit? No. Until now. Owing to the rapidly growing popularity of natural plant-based sweeteners, they thought it would be of interest to determine whether natural sweeteners would be a healthier alternative to sugar or artificial sweeteners. So they randomized people to drink an aspartame-sweetened beverage versus monk fruit sweetened versus stevia versus table sugar. And then they measured blood sugars over 24 hours, and there was no significant difference found between any of them. Uh, but wait a second. I mean, the sugar group was given 16 spoonfuls of sugar, the amount of added sugar in a 20-ounce bottle of Coke. So the other three groups consumed 16 less spoonfuls of sugar and still had the same average blood sugars? Uh, but table sugar caused a big blood sugar spike. Here it is. I'll show you. Drink that bottle of sugar water with its 20 sugar cubes worth of sugar, and your blood sugars jump 40 points over the next hour. Whereas you give an aspartame sweetened beverage, or monk fruit, or stevia, and nothing happens, which is what you'd expect, right? I mean, these are non-caloric sweeteners, no calories. Uh, it's just like you're drinking water, right? So how could your daily blood sugar values average out the same? I mean, the only way that could happen is if the non-calorie sweeteners maybe made your blood sugar spikes worse somehow later in the day? Look what happens when you give people Splenda mixed with sugar water. You get a greater blood sugar spike, a greater insulin spike, chugging the sugar with sucralose than without, even though Splenda alone causes no spike of its own. So does aspartame do the same thing? At the one-hour mark, they fed people a regular lunch. And so the blood sugars went back up and down as they normally would after a meal, uh, not spiking as high as drinking straight sugar water, just a gentle up and down. OK, but that was in the group that drank the sugar an hour before. In the group that drank the aspartame, even though their blood sugars didn't rise at the time, an hour later at lunch they shot up higher as if the person had just drank a bottle of soda. OK, but what about the natural sweetener, stevia and monk fruit? Same thing, same exaggerated blood sugar spike to a regular meal taken an hour later. So you can see how it all equals out in terms of average blood sugars, even though in these three non-caloric sweetener groups uh, they took in 16 spoonfuls less sugar. 
at least in part because they ate more after drinking a Diet Coke. You're more likely to eat more at your next meal than drinking a regular Coke. In fact, so much more that the energy saved from replacing sugar with non-caloric sweeteners was fully compensated for at a subsequent meal. Hence, no difference in total daily calorie intake was found. The sugar-sweetened beverage led to large spikes in both blood sugar and insulin, whereas these responses were higher for the three other beverages following the lunch later. So when it came to calorie intake, or blood sugars, or insulin spikes, they were all just as bad. Our entire understanding of the cause of dandruff shifted with this landmark article published in 1984. Instead of relying on secondary sources, reviews, editorials, opinion pieces, he looked at the primary literature, the original studies, and was amazed to find out how overwhelming was the evidence of the true cause, and how it had been ignored because it was so well buried under the mountain of error since some expert in the 1800s put forth some bogus theory. Uh, we now know that dandruff is triggered by a fungus that lives and feeds on the human scalp, uh, the two major implications being, first, how alarming it is that some bogus theory can remain in the medical literature unchallenged for a century, despite evidence to the contrary. And second, hey, if it's a fungus, what about trying tea tree oil, which contains components that have antifungal activity against a range of fungi? That was based on studies like this, though, where tea tree oil in a petri dish can fight off pathogenic skin fungi, but you don't know if it works for dandruff until you put it to the test. 126 men and women randomized to daily use of a 5% tea tree oil shampoo or placebo for a month. The placebo worked a little bit, decreasing dandruff severity by about 10%, but the tea tree oil shampoo worked better, about a 40% drop. Uh, looks like more than 40% from the graph, but that's because they misleadingly started the y-axis at negative 60. This is a classic deception, uh, featured in Chapter 5 of the 1954 classic How to Lie with Statistics. The graph should really look like this, which makes the effect less impressive, but it was still statistically significant. Only one patient in the tea tree oil group actually achieved a complete response. The one in the placebo group did as well. Thus, it seems that the tea tree oil shampoo would require ongoing application for control of dandruff. Speaking of fungus, what about tea tree oil in the treatment of athlete's foot? That may actually be our most common fungal skin infection, affecting up to 1 in 10. So about 100 patients randomized into one of three groups. 10% tea tree oil cream, Tynactin, an antifungal drug, or a placebo cream. A month later, the fungus was wiped out in 85% of the drug group, but only about a quarter of the placebo and tea tree oil groups. This is somewhat surprising, since tea tree oil can kill off the fungus in a petri dish, but apparently not on toes. That reminds me of some of the oral health data on tea tree oil. I mean, it can wipe out some oral pathogens in a petri dish, but have people swish a tea tree oil solution around their mouth? And here's the dental plaque buildup after four days of no brushing, swishing with a placebo. Here's swishing with a medicated chlorhexidine mouthwash, which helps keep the plaque a bit at bay. But the tea tree oil mouth rinse, no effect. So if tea tree oil doesn't influence the amount of plaque, presumably it wouldn't help with gingivitis, the gum inflammation that's caused by plaque buildup. But no, here's the twist. True, no reduction in plaque with a 2.5% tea tree oil gel, yet significant reduction in gingivitis scores. Since decreased gum inflammation occurred without a decrease in plaque, it appeared to just be helping more from an anti-inflammatory rather than antimicrobial mechanism. Might the same thing be happening here? Uh, yeah, from a mycological cure standpoint, a fungus cure standpoint, tea tree oil didn't really do any better than placebo. But though the drug wiped out the fungus in 85% of cases, in some of those cases the patient actually didn't notice an improvement in symptoms, or they actually felt worse after the drug, probably a reflection of Tynactin's irritant side effects. If instead of mycological cure you looked at symptom improvement, tea tree oil works as well as the drug. 
so this may be the basis for the popular use of tea tree oil in the treatment of athlete's foot. But you know, people should realize it's, it's just symptomatic relief, and they're not necessarily eliminating the underlying cause. Of course, maybe they didn't use a strong enough concentration. And indeed, if you go with not a 10% cream, but up to 25 or 50%, you can get mycological cure rates above that of placebo, uh, but still not as good as the drug. And at those high concentrations, some of the patients applying tea tree oil developed moderate to severe dermatitis. They broke out in a rash. But hey, if you have a patient that doesn't want to use the medicated creams, then a 25% tea tree oil application has a decent chance of knocking it out without being too risky, but the standard over-the-counter antifungal creams may work better. Oncomycosis is a fungal infection of our nails, uh, usually toenails, but sometimes fingernails, characterized by nail discoloration, deformity, detachment, thickening, crumbling, ridging. And here's an example of what it can look like. Reported prevalence is estimated to be about 1 in 25 people, though it's more common in older individuals, 1 in 5, over 60, and like half of 70-year-olds. Unfortunately, it's really hard to treat, because the fungus can hide deep inside the nail, protect it from the blood supply on one side, or anything you want to put on topically on the other. So recurrence after treatment is common due to residual fungus, even if you're able to beat it back. Uh, many of the oral systemic treatments can be toxic, and many topical applications require long treatment courses, which may limit patient compliance, especially in patients who want to use nail polish or something to cover it up. So given all the problems uh, with a lot of the prescription antifungals, there has been renewed interest in natural remedies. Well, if tea tree oil can affect athlete's foot and dandruff fungus, what about nail fungus? Well, there was this study of a combination of the antifungal drug and Lotrimin cream with tea tree oil that seemed pretty effective compared to nothing, but what about compared to each other? Well, there was one head-to-head -head study comparing tea tree oil with a common antifungal drug, a double-blind, randomized controlled trial, twice daily application of either the drug or pure tea tree oil on the nail for six months. Uh, debridement was performed every few months, where some of the fungal mass is debulked, scraped, ground off. And after six months, the drug only wiped the fungus out completely in about 1 in 10 cases, but looked better with partial full resolution of the appearance in the majority of patients, either from the doctor's assessment or the patient's. And the tea tree oil did just as well. The two preparations were comparable in efficacy of cure, clinical assessment, and subjective improvement. Even their cost was comparable. Uh, so for patients desiring a natural treatment for athlete's foot or nail fungus, topical tea tree oil is a reasonable alternative to prescription or over-the-counter antifungals. Speaking of natural treatments, how about a truly natural treatment? You know, one potential reason for the poor long-term benefits of any therapy for nail fungus is that it may only be treating a manifestation of underlying disease, such as generalized immune suppression, or a peripheral micro- or macrovascular disease. Maybe fungal nail infections are just a manifestation of poor peripheral blood circulation that would normally allow your body's natural defenses to keep the fungus from taking root in the first place. Evidently, there was a non-English language study of 400 patients that looked at the relationship between blood circulation of the skin, and development of fungal disease. That was the title, and found a greater than 50% reduction in blood flow in patients with athlete's foot and nail fungus compared with patients without these disorders. So if fungal nail infections are just a symptom of an underlying process, then treatment aimed at eradication of a pathogen may be unrealistic. No wonder it just grows right back. A more appropriate goal then may be to just give up and live with it. Uh, but wait, if it's a circulation problem, why not instead improve the circulation? We've known since the 1950s that you can effectively switch peripheral artery circulation on and off like a light switch within days by switching people between a low-fat plant-based diet and a more conventional diet that contributed to the problem in the first place. In 1854, a case report was published in the precursor of the British Medical Journal suggesting 
two to three tablespoons of brewer's yeast every day could cure diabetes within six weeks. But it took another 150 years before it was finally put to the test in a randomized, double-blind, controlled clinical trial of about a half of a teaspoon of brewer's yeast a day for three months. What happened? A significant drop in fasting blood sugar and hemoglobin A1c, as well as an improvement in insulin sensitivity. Uh, what do these numbers mean, though? Uh, hemoglobin A1c is a measure of how high your blood sugars have been over, over time. Under 6 means you've been having normal blood sugars. Between 6 and 6.5 means you have prediabetes, and anything over 6.5 means you have diabetes. Now, you can have well-controlled diabetes or way out-of-control diabetes, but anything over 6.5 is considered diabetic. In the study, the placebo group started up at around 9, and stayed up around 9, but the brewer's yeast group dropped from 9 to 8. Uh, so the placebo group was stuck up at 9, and the yeast group dropped from 9 down to 8. Uh, so they weren't cured, but in three months' time, they were able to achieve significantly better diabetic control just eating a half a teaspoon of brewer's yeast a day, which would cost about four pennies a day, four cents a day. What about for just seven weeks? Again, a total of about a half a teaspoon of brewer's yeast a day started out with an A1C level of 8. The placebo appeared to help a bit, but the yeast even more, from 8 down to an almost non-diabetic 6.6. That's amazing. How could it be? Well, uh, the drug industry has been trying for decades to discover the so-called glucose tolerance factor in yeast. After all, no shareholder is going to be happy with a therapy you can buy for only 4 cents a day. We know that whatever it is in yeast that's doing it contains the trace mineral chromium. Uh, well, can you just give chromium supplements alone? Uh, just giving straight chromium does not appear to be particularly effective. Uh, might the special fiber in yeast, the beta-glucans, play a role? Supplementation with the amount of beta-glucan found in 2 to 3 teaspoons of brewer's yeast a day did result in a slimmer waist and a drop in blood pressure within six weeks. Um, they trimmed about an inch off their waist, despite no significant change in caloric intake. Blood pressures were significantly reduced as well, in effect also seen with whole brewer's yeast. Just a half teaspoon of brewer's yeast a day led to a significant drop in high blood pressure, which incidentally is a key contributor to the cardiovascular and kidney complications of diabetes. Over the last several decades, medicine has waged a major war against cancer, concentrating on earlier diagnosis and improved therapy, the war is not being won. Nevertheless, medicine shows a few signs of admitting that its strategy may be flawed. In this, it resembles a World War general who stated, casualties, huge, ground gained, negligible. Conclusion, press on. If you look at the contribution of cancer-killing chemo to five-year survival in cancer patients, it's on the order of only about 2%. Now, there are some pediatric cancers we've gotten good at treating, and testicular cancer and Hodgkin's disease are exceptions. But if you look at our most common cancers, colon, lung, breast, prostate, the success rate is only about 1%, meaning like out of nearly 14,000 colon cancer patients, only 146 lived out five years thanks to the chemotherapy. So the chance of survival benefit is like 1 in 100, uh, but doctors don't tell patients that. New chemotherapy drugs are promoted as major breakthroughs, only to be later quietly rejected. The minimal impact on survival in, in the more common cancers you know, conflicts with the perceptions of many patients who feel they're receiving a treatment that will significantly enhance their chances of cure. In view of the minimal impact of cytotoxic chemotherapy on five-year survival and the lack of any major progress over the last 20 years, it follows that its main role is really in palliation. Right? It, it can shrink tumors down, relieving pain and pressure, but that doesn't tend to translate into living any longer. 
the failure of therapy, uh, coupled with the realization that the overwhelming majority of cancer is related to environmental, particularly lifestyle factors, dictates that prevention should be our foremost aim. Cancer is largely a preventable disease, but it does require major lifestyle changes. Of the millions diagnosed with cancer every year, as many as 90 to 95% of cancers are caused by lifestyle factors, and only 5 to 10% caused by bad genes. We know this because of enormous differences in the incidence of different forms of cancer around the world, which then change when people move from one place to another. Uh, so for example, breast cancer rates differ by an order of magnitude, with the lowest rates in parts of Africa and Asia, until they move and start eating and living like Americans, Argentinians, Europeans, or Australians. So uh, there's a need for a major reappraisal of how the problem of cancer is approached. The key to winning the war on cancer is prevention, which not only works better, but has the great advantage that entails nothing worse than nicotine or jelly bean withdrawal symptoms. On the other hand, cancer treatment, e even when successful, often exposes the patient to much suffering, both physical and psychological. Indeed, some cancer treatments are considered worse than the disease. Most importantly, though, a healthy lifestyle can nip it in the bud, whereas early diagnosis and treatment, by definition, doesn't change the cancer rate. It doesn't change the number of people getting cancer in the first place. In terms of cancer prevention and treatment with nutrition, the consumption of animal-based food components has been historically associated with increased cancer risk, while certain plant-based food components associated with decreasing risk. So it's not enough to just avoid the bad stuff. Right? Eating is pretty much a zero-sum game. Everything we put in our mouth is a lost opportunity to put something even healthier in our mouth. So it's not just avoiding foods with cancer-promoting properties. We need to eat foods with active cancer-suppressing mechanisms. By holistic nutrition. We're talking about whole foods. Yes, these are some of the purported active ingredients of healthy things like turmeric, or green tea, or broccoli, but this is how we should get them, not from pills. Yes, ultimately cancer development may primarily be a nutrition-responsive disease, but we're not talking about nutritional supplements, but rather whole, intact food.